this year's uh, Osler Business Law Forum. I'm Kim Bruce, the dean here at the law school, and I think I know uh, everybody in this room, so the million is in that. The, um, I'm delighted to have Professor Claire Hill here with us today. She's at the University of Minnesota, and Professor Rothman will introduce her in some more detail in a minute. This forum was originally established in 2001. The general purpose is to enhance the exchange of ideas about business law in the law school within the legal and business communities in Atlantic Canada. I'm proud of the contributions our school makes in this area, and we have a fair number of our business law faculty here today, which I'm delighted to see, um, both in the province, again, across the country, uh, and internationally. And this forum serves as a key component in our overall program for the year. I'm sure that you'll enjoy today's lecture. I'm sure you'll especially enjoy the presenter, Claire Hill. I first came to meet Claire Hill when I was um, in my first year of teaching at Queen's University, charged with bringing in interesting visitors. And someone recommended Claire, and she came and gave a fabulous talk. She was uh, enthusiastic, engaging, smart, energetic. When we went out for dinner, she ordered uh, Eau de Vie, which I'd never heard of um, before, and it just translates literally into um, the, the water of life. And I think you'll find uh, in hearing Claire talk that it's a perfectly appropriate drink. So I'll turn it to Professor Rock. Thanks, Kim. Uh, I'm Glenn Rotman, the Purdy Crawford Chair in Business Law here at uh, Dalhousie, and it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Claire Hill from the University of Minnesota Law School. Uh, I want to say a bit about uh, Claire's very impressive background, and then I will turn things over to her for, uh, for the paper. Uh, Claire has a BA and an MA in Philosophy from the University of Chicago. She graduated summa cum laude uh, with her JD from American University. Uh, as well, she has an LLM and SJD from Columbia, where she was an Olin Fellow, and joined the University of Minnesota Law School in 2006. Her teaching areas include corporate law, mergers and acquisitions, contracts, she also teaches law and economics. She is the founding director of the law school's Institute for Law and Rationality, and the associate director of its Institute for Law and Economics. She's also an affiliated faculty member of the University Center for Cognitive Sciences. Uh, she is currently the James L. Cruzmark Chair in Law, which she was appointed to in 2011. Previous to that, she had other uh, prestigious appointments. She was the Julius E. Davis Professor in 2007-8, the Vance K. Opperman Research Scholar in 2008-2009, and the Solly Robbins Distinguished Research Fellow in 2009-2011. And prior to entering academia, Claire practiced corporate law at various firms, including Milbach Tweed, Hadley and McCloy in New York, and Dick Stein and Shapiro in Washington, D.C. In addition to teaching in Minnesota, she's also taught at uh, the law school at Boston University, George Mason University, Northwestern, Georgetown, where she was a Sloan visiting professor, and she was also a freelance scholar at the University of Chicago, Kent. Her research interests include corporate governance, capital structure, structured finance, rating agencies, secured debt, contract theory, law and language, and behavioral economics. Claire's <laughs> published numerous, numerous articles on a variety of uh, topics, including, including these. But she doesn't only publish in law reviews, which is quite interesting for a legal academic. She also publishes in journals of finance and journals in psychology. And I've had the pleasure to, uh, to read a number of Claire's pieces, and particularly a lot of pieces that she's written with her colleague, Brett McDonald at the University of Minnesota. Um, Claire, I think, is an example of what a lot of us corporate law profs aspire to be. Um, interesting. <laughs> a lot of people seem to feel that we just talk about rules and this is how you do things. Uh, Claire looks beyond that. It's, it's much deeper, uh, it's much richer uh, kind of scholarship. And her interest, again, inspires and influences the rules and regulations that we do have to follow. But it also looks beyond that to say, okay, well, why do we do these things? What's the rationale? What's the reason for looking at these? And uh, really, really interesting stuff. Uh, her, her talk today is entitled The Pervasive Effects of Priors. So, and here's my attempt at humor, um, which may or may not go over well. I'm trying not to allow my, you know, any prior knowledge that I may have influence what, um, what you may think about what Claire is going to be speaking about. But there's also, if you are interested in learning a bit more about what Claire's going to be speaking about today, she's blogged on this topic on uh, concurrentopinions.com, I believe in, uh, in April, I think, of, of this year, March or April of this year, so that may be something if you want to uh, 
to check out. But uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Claire Hill. Well, I want to thank uh, Kim and th uh, for inviting me and the gracious introduction, and Len for the stunningly gracious introduction and for the setup where you say I'm going to try not to let my priors uh, influence me because that gives me my punchline of the whole talk, and you won't succeed. <laughs> so there you have it. Um, this talk may be a little bit... Uh, I mean, he's used words like interesting, which presumably, I hope he means in the actual sense and not in the euphemistic sense, maybe a bit of both. Uh, you will judge for yourselves. This is sort of me taking a bit of advantage of how many years I've been doing things and trying to, in a sense, push the envelope, but in a way doing that by going back to basics. And you will see what I mean shortly. So here's this title, The Pervasive Effect of Priors. Or, well, this is about business law. So this is the pervasive effect of priors in business law. <clears throat> what is business law anyway? Well, kind of. Um, I sometimes try to have slides that don't have a lot of stuff. This one, on purpose, I wanted a lot of stuff because I want to take the position that business law really, uh, in any proper parlance, encompasses lots of different kinds of law. Indeed, many fields, if not most fields of law, can properly be considered business law. So here's this long list. So here's my starting point. Priors matter for law. What are priors? Well, when I give a version of this talk, people always say, so what do you mean by priors? Well, I'm going to be spending the bulk of next year trying to figure that out. So I can't give a definitive definition, but what I can say is, I mean, philosophy has this concept called the given, which gives a flavor of it. Um, I also say it includes temperaments, values, and beliefs. I have beliefs highlighted here because that's what I'm mostly going to talk about. And the other intuitive way to get at what priors are is some people say, well, isn't this paper just about or this whole project just about confirmation bias, a term you've probably heard. People like to confirm what they thought before. But the question is, what did they think before? What does confirmation bias seek to confirm? All of this is just by way of getting you to an intuitive sense of what priors are. Why do they matter? Well, they influence what we do, what we think, including what happened, what could happen, and what should happen. These are obviously big claims, and I'm going to try to defend them today and again next year as I work on the book. Why do these things, why do priors matter for law? Well, law tries to do sort of the same things. Law tries to influence behavior. It's one of the big things it does. It involves necessarily assessments of what happened by judges, jurors, administrative um, officials, and ordinary folk involves assessments of what could happen and what should happen. So what am I going to try to do today? I'm going to demonstrate priors matter for law, including with racy examples, I hope. And I'm going to argue that this approach has got some payoffs, ideally you know, better policy, maybe better basis for an application of law, but more realistically, just getting people to <laughs> not make lens mistakes. Sorry. I'm going to not let my priors affect me. Well, not so hard, I'm going to argue, and perhaps impossible, including for me. So I'm going to do this by talking about some corporate law debates and fulfilling the stereotype of a boorish, of a boorish uh, uh, person from the United States. I'm going to talk about hot policy debates in the United States. I mean, I may be in Canada, but hey, what are the important debates? The hot policy, yeah, OK. Um, so one of them is so-called proxy access. And this debate is about whether or not when shareholders get management's proxy statement once a year to vote on directors, there ought to potentially be included on that proxy statement some nominees that other shareholders have picked. So once a year, shareholders asked, OK, vote for directors. Usually, the people on the slate, the people that they're asked to vote on, are people who the management effectively has picked. But there is some call to give shareholders more rights to include their own nominees. 
and I say, you know, the positions are basically more proxy access or less proxy access. I could talk for a very long time about this. I'm sure people would find it excruciating. Even I would find it kind of boring, and I find many obscure things interesting. So that's one debate, proxy access. Another one, so-called 13D. So this is a filing under the securities laws that people who get 5% or more shares of a company have to make to announce, in effect, that they have done this because this is deemed to presage the possibility that they might be interested in taking over the company. So the idea is management perhaps should get a chance to prepare, should get a chance to know that there is Mr. 5.0001 guy out there who may be thinking to make a move. And the schedule, the question then is, when do you have to disclose and what do you get to do between the time you acquire and the time you disclose? So the position, the rule now, disclosure of more than 5% holdings within 10 days, question, do you shorten the number of days, and do you limit the ability to acquire shares during those days. So the present rule, you get 5.001, and then you can just run out and you say, OK, in 10 days, I'm going to file, and then you just buy everything in sight between now and then. And again, those are the two positions with respect to what to do with those debates. Some more debates at sort of a greater level of generality. How easy should it be to take over a company? And there's these devices, one of them called a staggered board. I don't know how much familiarity of this sort of stuff to assume. Basically, two possibilities for a board. One of them is, let's say, nine people elected every year. The other possibility is nine people divided into three classes. And each one has a three-year term, but no two terms expire at the same time. So to get a majority of the people on the board would take two years rather than one, because you need to get six directors out of the nine, let's say, and only three directors' terms expire each year. So debate here, that's a staggered board. And so the question then in the debate is, who decides if a company should have a staggered board? Also, who decides if a company should have a so-called poison pill? Again, I don't know what familiarity to assume, but for our purposes, simply a device that makes it much more expensive to acquire a company unless you're someone the management really likes a lot. So with respect to proxy access, I've included here some arguments in favor and against. And just to anticipate my punchline, my punchline is basically going to be that the way to understand a lot of what's going on in these debates is via the priors. So here's the SEC chairman at the time, Mary Shapiro. As a matter of fairness and accountability, long-term significant sh shareholders should have a means of nominating candidates to the boards of the companies that they own. Nominating a candidate is not the same as electing a candidate. I have great faith in the collective wisdom of shareholders to determine which competing candidates will best fulfill the responsibilities of serving as a director. So, sounds pretty unassailable. But massive, massive controversy on the other side. I don't actually have time to get into all the reasons for it. but. One set of reasons is, however you design it, someone's going to abuse it. And here is an articulation from the court case that struck down one attempt to have proxy access. There is good reason to believe that institutional investors with special interests will be able to use the rule. And as more than one commentator, commenter noted, public and, un and union pension funds are the institutional investors most likely to make use of proxy access. And here's, I love this, here's another argument on proxy access. Um, and we'll, we'll have some things to say about it. This is the letterhead. I've just copied the whole thing from the, the SEC's website. If you make a comment, it's publicly available. So here's the guy's letterhead, Don's Tractor Repair and Sales. And below it, he's writing to Elizabeth Murphy, the relevant person at the SEC. And here's his argument. As a small business owner, I am against any action that would give the federal government more authority over publicly traded companies or smaller businesses. The current administration has forgotten what this country was built on. It was the little guy starting businesses which led to corporations. 
Our federal government should not intrude on publicly traded corporations and corporate state laws should remain intact. My father started this business 30 years ago and I bought it 10 years ago. We've expanded over the years and have anticipated opening a fourth tractor repair service. Due to the condition of our economy and Americans tightening their belts, we may not have this option. If the companies I purchase parts from are caught up in expensive proxy contests, I'm afraid they will not be able to deliver the parts that I need at a reasonable cost and in a timely manner. Let's go back here. This guy is in, well, actually, I'll show you where he is. He's in Wakefield, Kansas. I'm sure he's sidling up at the bar making these remarks. It seems a little strange. Changing the proxy rules could put me right out of business if it becomes too costly for me to continue business as usual. My hope is to one day pass a thriving business to my children. But if the federal government continues to get involved with their not, where they are not needed, that might never happen. This is one of the great country, greatest countries in the world, and we achieve this by working together, not against each other. I will not support any effort to change the shareholder proxy access rule for the sake of all businesses, including my own. Best Tim Zumbrun of Don's Tractor Repair. I mean, I would wager that before the business roundtable came to him with a model letter, he never heard of proxy access. And even after they did, he probably doesn't know what it is. But he's, oh, I'll sign this. I'll send it in. That's my prior that this guy can't possibly have these kind of views. Um, maybe he does. And if he did, let's think about what would be motivating him? Again, what is proxy access? Proxy access is the ability of some shareholders, not any old shareholder, somebody with a big stake in a company, to suggest a name to be put on the proxy statement that shareholders get so that shareholders might potentially elect the person as a director of the corporation. So what I'm trying to persuade you of here is that all of this stuff, many of these views, are driven by people's priors. Here are some relevant priors that you might have. For instance, you might think that the paradigmatic corporate officer or director is a good steward of corporate interests. If you think that's the case, then you like the idea of those people continuing in office. Or you might think, well, they really want a bigger desk, they want more money. And so what they need is someone else committed to holding them to account. They need someone who's interested in working with the company but offering a critical perspective, and that person is going to come via a shareholder-nominated director. Similarly, what do people think about so-called shareholder activists? Say, uh, again, big, do you have uh, um, such people? You must have people here. And not only actually do you have people here, you have some of the Americans here. Pershing Square has made quite a splash, I gather, doing a variety of uh, very uh, strong things. I'm trying to find a good word for it. So we have these people big shareholders who have very, very emphatic views as to what ought to happen to companies and are going to do many active things to make those things happen. And so again, you'll ask, and what kind of people are they? Are these in general people who are smart, long-term oriented? Or are they short-term oriented and they somehow want to put the big bucks in their pocket and then leave the company in a wreck? And I write here, an ego can lead to big mistakes. There are some accusations, again, about these kinds of people who attempt to exercise large quantities of power with respect to corporations. That, well, they let their egos get the better of them, and therefore, they do really bad things to companies. Finally, with respect to another kind of shareholder, notorious shareholder activist, which is public pension funds or labor union types, Again, you might think, well, they're generally smart and motivated. That's what my students, smart and well motivated. That's what my students usually think when they first hear about them. And then you might have a more cynical perspective. Well, they're motivated by politics. The leaders of these funds, sometimes they get reelected by people to whom they have to make the case. And then they want to say, I've taken a pro-labor stance or something. Perhaps they get appointed by some governor and they need to demonstrate whatever it is that's going to help the governor get reelected. Or maybe the member's self-interest or political views. The company 
is in whatever business it's in, but the pension fund or the labor union would like them to be particularly solicitous to employees or maybe show concern for environmental things or something, all of which might not do wonders for the company's profits, um, or maybe they want even a company that pays more money to employees, again, not doing wonders for the company's profits. Whether or not these are good things, the question is, are these people appropriate voices to be speaking for and trying to influence the corporation? And your view on that question is going to enormously affect your view of what you think about proxy access. If you're going to think the uh, corporate officers and directors are, in general, good stewards of corporate interests, you're going to think, who needs proxy access? You're going to think, let's leave things as they are. The kind of people who are going to be trying to get power are pests and nuisances. Um, or worse still, they're people who bombast, who think they know better, but they're trying to put a quick buck in their pocket. Proxy access is going to prevent poor Mr. Zumbrun from leaving his business to his children, and all sorts of other bad things are going to happen. Returning to Mr. Zumbrun's priors, though. What does Mr. Zumbrun think about government? I mean, again, I'm sort of hypothesizing that he never heard of proxy access until the, round t uh, the business roundtable came to Wakefield, Kansas, and handed him this letter and told him to type it on his letterhead. But I would bet, again, my prior, that Mr. Zumbrun was receptive to this because he has view number two over here, paradigmatic actors, government actors are incompetent, trying to keep power or help their friends or both. Not that he thinks that people in government are smart and well-intentioned. I would also suspect that he might think in particular that government likes to or is uh, indifferent to increasing costs to entrepreneurs because, hey, that's a view of government, and perhaps he has this. Lots of different views of government here that are possible. If you think the SEC is smart and well-intentioned, you might say, ah, let's leave proxy access in their hands. They'll probably come up with something good. Whereas if you think that they're trying to help their friends, you might have a different view. Here's another. This is the specifics of the 13D debate. Again, this takes my poor students have to listen to this stuff for two hours from me, and I will luckily only give you, you know, a few minutes of it. But it's in broad brush the same issue, a little bit more specifically. Here are people who may want to take over a company. They've acquired more than 5%. The question is, what does the company get to know, and when does the company get to know it? Assume it's true as sort of an empirical fact about the world that people who acquire more than 5% may be having acquisition on their mind. Then the question of whether you want to give management the ability to fight against that, to prepare for it, turns on whether you think the same thing that we've just been talking about, whether the management are the good stewards and the hedge fund guy, let's say, is short-term oriented. If you think the hedge fund guy is short-term oriented you th and maybe he's got a big ego or whatever, then you think that let's give management the tool to fight that guy. If you think the opposite, then, well, it's pretty straightforward. So, uh, Marty Lipton, the guy who invented the poison pill, he thinks corporate managers are great stewards. Beb Chuck is a Harvard Law professor who's made his living arguing that institutional investors know better and that management doesn't worry enough about uh, doing right by shareholders and worries much more about the size of their desks and keeping their jobs. So naturally, Lipton says, we should require anybody buying big chunks of the company to Disclose quickly, not buy any more. And Lipton says the opposite. He says we shouldn't be letting companies prepare for the attack of the activist shareholder because the activist shareholder is doing good and management is just motivated by trying to keep its job. Bebchuk, in fact, has made a whole project at the Harvard Law School trying to give shareholders more power in having take anti-takeover devices removed. Recall that I had 
noted these debates. How easy should it be to take over a company? You will not be surprised to, to hear that Lipton, who I'm just using as a stand-in for all people of this position, although for a guy in, I think, in his 80s, he's, he's out and about articulating the position a lot, thinks it should be very hard. Management's got the best interests at stake, blah, blah, blah. Whereas Bebchuk thinks it should be much easier because management is just trying to keep their jobs. So theme and variations. Bebchuk gets the Harvard Law School to start the shareholder rights project where he's got students working with institutional investors to get rid of these staggered boards that I mentioned to you earlier, where there are three directors elected one year, three directors elected the second year, and the three directors elected the third year, so that in order to get six out of the nine, it takes two years rather than being able to control by reelecting all nine in one year. So he's made this huge project of this. He's been, again, I, I speak as though it's only Bebchuk, it might as well be, he's everywhere, saying this stuff. And he's got this project at Harvard where he's got students working on this. So he said it assists public pension funds and charitable organizations in improving corporate governance. To him, this is unambiguously an improvement, again, because these, uh, the, the institutional shareholders are good guys and the management are just too comfortable and they have too many weapons to fight off people who might want to hold them to account. So improving corporate governance, here's all our clients. The proposals urge companies with a staggered board, which allow them to replace only a few directors to place all board number, members up for election. Such a move to annual elections is viewed by investors as a best practice by enabling shareholders to register their views, more accountability to shareholders, et cetera. And then what is Lipton? Again, he's my stand-in, but he really he spends a lot of time talking about this. While the activist bloc likes to tout annual elections as a best practice on their one-size-fits-all corporate governance scorecards, there's no persuasive evidence that declassing, declassifying boards enhance shareholder, enhances shareholder value over the long term. The argument that annual review is necessary for accountability, precisely the argument that Bebchuk made, is as specious in the corporate setting as it is in the political arena in seeking to undermine board stewardship. The sh I mean, you can see him sneering as he says this, right? The shareholder rights project and its activist supporters are making an unsubstantiated value judgment. They prefer a corporate uh, governance system which allows for a greater incidence of intervention and control by fund managers on the belief, etc. So that's Lipton and then he continues, the essential purpose of corporate governance is to create a system in which long-term output and societal benefit are maximized, creating prosperity for the ultimate beneficiaries. Short-term measurement, again he's sneering, he's thinking about um, activist hedge funds, who are his arch enemies, um, and compensation of investment managers is not necessarily consistent with these de desired results. He's saying here, these fund managers, they're trying to increase their short-term returns. That's not going to help the company or the shareholders long-term. Therefore, Lipton says, I'm right. Bebchuk is wrong. So the bottom line with respect to resolving this kind of debate, I think, is the following. Well, which is better for the shareholders? I mean, we could talk about the, uh, what's good for other constituencies like employees or the community or something. But for right now, we're confining the discussion to shareholders. And here are my, I mean, I've sort of articulated my views here. First, that the initial positions are strongly informed by, <clears throat> by priors, and I've demonstrated I hope that's the case. You'd like to have the policy informed by empirical evidence, but not so easy. The first thing is, I mean, I have fMRI. I, I go to these conferences, this uh, Gruder Institute, where people talk about neuroscience. And one can fantasize about putting you know, all the hedge fund managers in, in, in uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging machines to try to see whether they're good guys or bad guys. And similarly with corporate managers, you'd say, oh, this one really does want a bigger desk. No, this one wants what's good for the company. And that would be very interesting. But obviously, the reason that you're giggling is because how are we going to do this? Clearly, the, FM, the, the, the science isn't there. And even if it were, not clear people would go down this road. So what you want to try to test is the results. <clears throat> the results are, of course, going to be hard because no two companies are identical, but for the fact that they have different governance. Things happen at different times, different products, different uh, economic um, markets, whatever. So you can't run what I'm calling the perfect desert island test, which is everything's the same, except you just vary the one thing you want to vary. And as is now well known, the interpretation of, empirical, of imperfect empirical work 
is strongly inf influenced by priors. There's been a massive amount of work done about this generally and in the context of gun control, which I think probably Canadians think Americans are totally lunatic about this. I think everyone other than Americans think they're totally lunatic about this. But the point is that some people in the, in the US love guns, some people hate them, both cite massive empirics in support of why guns are a good or bad thing. And the empirics never persuade anybody on the other side. The empirics uh, uh, never persuade people who love guns that, oh, gee, guns you know, killed 27 cute little kids last week because the parents forgot the safety locks. They never persuade the people who hate guns that, gee, guns um, were pointed at 400 bad guys, and therefore they didn't shoot or be able to do mischief. The priors are just stronger than any form thus far that the evidence could take. Let me give you some other examples. Well, first I have here a related example with a pedagogical payoff. I, I, I kind of love doing this with my students because it's like one of these very rare moments where you can say a few things and they go, oh, and you feel like a big shot. There are so few moments like that in teaching. Um, so, when students first learn about, we have uh, so-called uh, derivative suits where shareholders, you've got the same thing here, right? Where shareholders get to bring a claim on behalf of the corporation. And all the cases re we read, the shareholders are always trying to bring the claim and the corporation's always able to stop them by saying, well, our directors really thought hard about this and the, and the, shareholders, and the students are always very suspicious. And they would say, well, why isn't it much easier? Why isn't this a totally easy situation where, you know, the courts are, uh, where, where we just say, shareholder wouldn't be bringing this suit unless the management was a bad guy and they did bad things, therefore the shareholder should be able to bring the suit readily. And many of them think this. And so I say, well, you're imagining the only kind of people who are going to bring these suits are like well-motivated, smart, whatever. And I say, well, here's some other possibility, nuisance and crank. Um, and you know, I, I say I myself personally know some shareholder, um, some, some people who are apt to bring lawsuits of this type who are cranks. And I have to, I, I, I'm going to do something a little bit of a, as I say, cheap shot. And I say, okay, you could say to your students, well, look, there's, you might take seriously the possibility that some shareholders are nuisances and cranks and maybe give them some evidence. And here, I can't resist. This is a great picture. This woman is not dead. Um, she has her gravestone. You can't see all of it, um, but let me read you part of what it says. Evelyn Y. Davis, she's a prominent shareholder active. She goes to loads of shareholder meetings. And here, two divorces, no children. Third divorce took place on such and such year. A fourth divorce took place in such and such. As I said, she keeps updating her tombstone. Defender of shareholder rights at many stockholder meetings nationally. Recognized at White House press conferences by several presidents since 1976. Power is greater than love and I did not get where I am by standing in line nor by being shy. So this woman is a presence at shareholder meetings. I mean, as it happens, she's not actually a crank. This makes it look like she's a crank. She's only a partial crank. And I've actually seen her, myself, do good things, calling corporate management to account. But she might have been a crank. This sure makes it look like she's a crank. If there's a lot of people who are cranks like this, and you give every one of them the right to sue corporate management because they think the management did something stupid and that the company is not going to sue them, then the management would do nothing but defend against cranked version of Evelyn Y. Davis. Here I have to give, say I actually it was a cheap shot, she's done many good things, and then I have over here the, the required permissions for Evelyn Y. Davis. Okay. <laughs> Let me give you another example. Um, Kim, how much longer do I have? 10, 15 minutes, something like that? Oh, perfect, perfect. Okay, so thus far the priors that I've talked about have been sort of archetypes, you know, corporate executive, good guy, or wants the bigger desk, or wants to keep in power, or, you know, a, a, a California pension fund activist, the guy, the person making the decision wants to keep his job and he wants to show what good things he's done for employees. Um, priors aren't just about what sorts of people are in what sorts of roles. They're much broader, which is one of the things that makes this project so huge. And one of the reasons I told you at the outset when you said what's a, what, when I asked what's a prior and said, well, it'll take me a long time to formulate that. 
One critical prior, for instance, is the securities law prior that better information makes for better decisions. Now, in some respect, that, that can't be wrong, but the thing I'm going to try to demonstrate to you is it's not quite as right as the securities laws need it to be. So here are some examples. I, I'm fascinated by these uh, subprimes, the synthetic CDOs, and I'm not going to go through lots of specifics. I don't have time beyond the scope, et cetera. Perhaps people have heard of Abacus, for which Goldman Sachs paid a $550 million. Uh, we don't admit or deny we did anything bad. Here's $550 million. Um, and one of the middle, middle management guys involved in this arguably scapegoated the fabulous fab Fabrice Touré. Anyway, this, these are notorious characters in the States in any event. So Abacus and Timberwolf is another name of one other one of these deals, many more. And again, I could, I could talk at some length because it's fun, but I will confine myself first to show you a picture of the fabulous fab. I've managed to sell a few Abacus bonds to widows and orphans that I ran into in the airport. Apparently, those Belgians adore synthetic ABS CDO squared, says the fabulous fab. Um, it's just sort of a notorious quote of his, and this is the middle management guy who was sued for civil fraud. He lost. Um, but my focus is actually not on this guy doing a bad thing. Quite the contrary. It's about investors having been warned like crazy that these deals were maybe not in their interests. Goldman Sachs shall not have a fiduciary relationship with any investor. These are their marketing materials. Goldman Sachs may, by virtue of its underwriter, uh, of its status as an underwriter, blah, 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 uh, has not undertaken, does not intend to disclose such and such. Accordingly, this presentation may not contain all information that would be material to the evaluation of the merits and risks of purchasing the notes. And in case you didn't get it, may from time to time in the future be an active participant on both sides, may have potential conflicts of interest. You know, if you're buying this stuff, oh, that fabulous fab, he told me it was great. He has you a piece of paper that says, up to you to investigate. We're not telling you anything. You sign this and say you've investigated. Here's Timberwolf. Recently, the, and these are the 2007 deals when things were starting to go south. Recently, the residential mortgage market has experienced a variety of difficulties. Delinquencies and losses with respect to residential mortgage loans generally have increased. Well, that sounds pretty bad. Housing prices and appraisal values in many states have declined or stopped appreciating. That doesn't sound so good either. How about numerous residential mortgage loan originators that originate subprime mortgage loans have recently experienced serious financial difficulties and in some cases bankruptcy? Yeah, so people are buying this stuff. Many other examples. Um, okay, I mean, many such things in the, uh, okay, so here's two examples and I'll go through the one a little bit more and the other one not so much. So the dot com bubble, lots of these companies, we don't make any money, we have no idea how we're gonna make money. People bought that anyway. Um, increased executive compensation disclosure, the SEC said, oh, well, executive compensation getting too high, if we just tell people more about it, maybe then outrage will, stem things. Well, the best empirics, again, very hard to do the studies because there's confounding factors, but I think most people, certainly I believe, that the main people who were influenced by this were CEOs who could run and say, that's Smedley, he's an idiot, he's making more money than I am. Board, if you want to send a signal, you've got the top CEO, you better give me dry cleaning for life too. And that this is, seems to have been what happened. I mean, ordinary mortals reading, oh, the CEO gets you know, 40 million and these options, and the other one gets 42 million and some other options. They say, this is all way more money than I can ever dream of. These increments are ridiculously meaningless to me. So here's from the dot-com bubble. I was looking for something good, pets.com. The 39 risk factor is not unusual, and here's one. Um, this is February 2000. We only began selling our products a year ago. Um, which makes it difficult for investors to determine whether we will accomplish our objectives. The success depends on attracting customers like we don't have any now. We have no idea what we're able to do. it. We have a history of losses. We expect significant increases in our costs and expenses to result in continuing losses for at least the next four years. We may not succeed in doing this. We may we need more money. Of course, our operating expenses are fixed. If we fail to da da da, we need more money. We still need more money. We may not get the more money. If we don't get the more money, we may go kaput. Okay, is it really a surprise that anything bad happens? 
What else could you have told people? You're an idiot for investing in this? How could they not know that from this? Okay. So what's going on here? I've actually thought a lot about this, and I've written a bunch of papers explaining the mechanisms by which people might choose to invest. Because it's not like they're saying, no revenue, that's the investment for me. It's not like they're choosing for no revenue, it's that somehow it doesn't matter. And why doesn't it matter? Well, their friends are doing it, it's the hot thing, there's some kind of narrative they glom onto. Language is complicated, people take aspirin, even though if you read all the stuff and take seriously on the back of the aspirin bottle, this one died, the other one had a stroke, it's all terrible, but people know, ah, it's okay, everyone I know takes aspirin, they're all fine, my doctor says it's fine, ergo, you sort of translate. So the puzzle then, and this is something else, this is my paper that I was telling you, Len, about the limits of disclosure, is it's not like anybody doesn't know what was in these abacus papers. It's not like it's some big secret that I unearthed. Securities documents notoriously con contain all sorts of disclosures written by the lawyers attempting to do the CYA, cover the backside thing, and yet people are buying them. You know, part of the story may be, well, they can't tell the difference between real risks and stuff the lawyers told them to put in or something, but what's certainly clear is that there's no straightforward line between telling people this thing is bad and them saying, hmm, better not buy it. So the question then is, why is anybody wasting time after the crisis saying, well, the problem is people didn't understand these securities. You don't have to understand them. Goldman Sachs, who does understand them, tells, him, tells you they're on the other side. Shouldn't that be enough? So the argument is priors, here's the kind of the meta argument, is that priors are dictating that we keep pushing on disclosure solutions, even though everyone knows that people bought this stuff that announced it was terrible. We can't sort of get away from better information somehow leads to better decisions. We also so much, at least, and this is a, a US pathology, have this obsession with the autonomy as versus paternalism. And we say, oh, it's so important that people make their own decisions even if they fall on their faces. You combine those kind of priors, and I would say the anti-government, anti-paternalism thing is a prior, with the inability to get consensus on anything else and the fact that everyone's saying, you gotta do something, you wanna say you did something, so you say, oh, we'll beef up the disclosure requirements. We'll make them tell people just how bad the stuff was as opposed to what they did before. So, the result, continuing emphasis on disclosure and perpetuation of prior. Some other examples, I mean, debates on freer access to the capital markets, should one be able to get money from investors a little bit more cheaply and easily with less disclosure, debates on what I'm calling equitable type exceptions to contract enforcement when, say, some consumer comes to court and says, well, I signed this, but um, ability to waive protective provisions. We have debates in my class as to whether or not somebody ought to be able to sign a contract that says the other guy, to be, let's say, a partner in a partnership where the other guy says, I have no fiduciary duties to anyone. Also, similarly, questions about whether people ought to be able to sign away their rights to go to court and bind themselves by arbitration. Some, some of the debates on Americans with Disabilities Act, and I want to say, yet again, these are informed by these archetypes I've been talking about, sort of, what do you think a paradigmatic high-level business person is? Somebody, he's got a dream, he wants to cure cancer, he just needs to raise some money. And so, well, it's a good thing to give it to him, or else maybe it's, gee, I want to tell people I've got a great business plan, but I, in fact, have no clue, and what I really want to do is to go on vacation and can't afford to do it, so I'm going to get money from people and they're gonna lose their money. Similarly, with respect to individuals getting into contracts, again, my example here, um, equitable type exceptions, ability to waive protective provisions. Is our paradigmatic person who signs one of these things someone who's chargeable with, well, they ought to be looking after themselves and they can read this, or are we gonna say, oh, they're a cute little person and bad business person is out to take advantage of them? And this example, the paradigmatic claimant here, I was inspired to think about this because uh, 
uh, also at this Grutter conference I keep mentioning, this is entrepreneur. All he'd ever heard of in the context of the Americans with Disabilities Act is friends of his who had been sued by people who claimed that they didn't have enough handicapped access. And so his idea was these people are out there doing great inventions. And all that ever happens to them is they get sued by somebody who's in the business of going around with their wheelchair and saying they can't get into places they never wanted to go anyway. This is their business plan. So what he thinks is this, and he thinks business business people are you know they're entrepreneurs they're good they want to do good and they're just being bogged down by these guys and if you say to him well some business people maybe you're up to no good you of course are up to only good but some are up to no good and some claimants are worthy folk who've had bad luck i said this to him and he was like oh i mean he just because he himself was a good guy businessman it hadn't occurred to him because all the people he knew, he met who needed, uh, who, who were trying to use Americans with Disabilities Act were opportunists. That's what he assumed they all were. And he'd never thought about it. So let me then get back, and I think my timing is going to be perfect here. I say related and belated point, <clears throat> implicit identification. Again, you know, when I talk to my students, when I have taught first year contracts, we have, I know that this is, again, lunacy in the US. We have employment at will. I know Canada does not. So in the US, you can hire people, fire people for any reason as long as it's not a bad reason. You don't like that they wear pink outfits. You don't like the, you know, the, the, the Axe body spray they use, whatever it is. It's all fine. <clears throat> and that's clearly the law. I mean, you may think it's a bad law, but that's clearly the law. But my students, whenever they hear about the fired employee, they always want to have some, oh, there must be a whistleblower exemption. There must be some reason why the employer has to keep them around. And I say, well, actually, they sort of isn't. Say, that's just wrong. And then you, re you, you say to them, well, what if you're the employer and Axe body spray drives you crazy? You have always want to run a business, and you just you know, you go in there with a clothespin on your nose all day. It's just terrible. You're really annoyed with it. Oh, I hadn't thought of that. So that's very gratifying to say, you are looking at this through the perspective of the employee. Similarly, with, you know, if there's some case where the tenant is evicted because they screwed up, they breached the provision of the lease, and they always think, oh, well, the contract should be interpreted to cut the tenant more slack. Why? Because they're the tenant. And similarly, disappointed buyer. So the idea is here to join together what I've said before. You've got representative archetypes, but you also have a sense of who you are, and that's going to be related to. I am, am an employee. Employees are generally not trying to take advantage. I am you know, a tenant. Tenants are not trying to take advantage, and landlords might be. So you know, I, I, had, I had to put in a political crack here. So we've got this view as to what kind of people landlords are, which is going to be a different view if we ourselves are landlords. Romney perhaps lost the election based on being taped as talking about 47% of the people who never paid, um, who, who didn't pay any federal income tax. And no one thought for a moment that he was sort of dispassionately describing this. It was like, there are those people. He was saying, as a fact, there's a class, there's an archetype of those people who have these characteristics. And those are them, not me or us or anyone worthy. Tying it all together. See, I told you how well timed this was. So one's own construction of the world is one way to get at what priors are. And one thing I want to emphasize, which I didn't have a chance to really highlight here, is that I'm not just talking about prior beliefs. Values are in the picture, too. I had uh, uh, a lawyer tell me once that there were cases where an executive clearly deserved because they had contracted for it some very high payoff, say, some, some salary or something. And this lawyer said, I advise this person to settle with the company when the company doesn't want to pay him, because the jurors are just going to say, no one deserves that kind of money, and they're not going to award it. Because just as a matter of, of priors, no one's worth 10 million or whatever it is. And again, he's of course saying, there's some class of people who get those bucks. I'm not one of them, and that's part of the picture. So, Again, the thesis, the effect of priors vastly underappreciated because of a particularly pernicious prior. That you don't have priors, and there you are. 
um, that one is viewing things neutrally and that one's views are well-founded and often that the other guys aren't. That part takes a bit more resonance in the political debates, which is another area in which I've been applying all of this. That is, you know, in all the area, you know, gun control or something, well, those people who love guns, you know, they're, they're somehow ignoring all that evidence of the little kids getting shot. You know, there's some sense in which the other guy's position is not legitimate and not subject to evidence, whereas one's own position is. And as I say, I think not so fast. Concluding with wild optimism. I can succeed in this ridiculous endeavor. Thank you. <laughs>